tried to run game on a nigga. Who's but wow with the trigger? Shame on a nigga who tried to run game on a nigga. Who bucks our fuck ass up? Yo, hut one, hut two, hut three, hut. Old dirty bastard, live and uncut. Styles unbreakable, shadow. I'm feeling a little conflicted about this one. Rest assured, levels of wishy washy hand ring will be off the charts today. Let me just say up front that I love ODB, and I always have. The man was one of the most unique and entertaining rappers who ever lived, with a style all his own, simply an iconic figure in the rap game. But there's a popular narrative that tends to spring up around these kinds of public figures. During their lifetimes are recognized for the exceptionally mercurial talents that they are, yet seemingly can't stop constantly getting caught acting a fool. Stop me if you've heard this old chestnut. Artistic creativity goes hand in hand with a disturbed mind, which is more often than not used as an excuse to let brilliant men off the hook for behaving like assholes. Make no mistake, as beloved as Old Dirty was for his flowing skills, off-kilter delivery, and almost brutally obscene, nasty lyrics, he became one of the most infamous rappers of the 90s for all the wrong reasons. Breaking the law with gleeful abandon, or in some cases, I think, almost complete oblivion. Inhaling hard drugs like it was going out of style, and just generally indulging in the kind of wild behavior that makes Kanye seem like a model of measured stability by comparison. So as much as I like his work, to celebrate the legacy of this man feels almost irresponsible. Like, I feel implicated by perpetuating this narrative, but it can't be avoided. He really was one of the best rappers who ever lived, a straight-up lyrical mastermind, and he was also a consummate troublemaker, with a persona that was equal parts lovable and off-putting. Yeah, he lived up to his name in just about every way. All of his names. A life and legacy this complicated just cannot be reduced to a set of simplistic generalizations. If you need any proof of that, watch me give it my best shot. Although the majority of the members of the legendary rap group he founded, the Wu-Tang Clan, came from Staten Island, Russell Tyrone Jones was born, presumably out of wedlock, on November 15, 1968, in Brooklyn. He and his cousins Robert Diggs, a.k.a. RZA, and Gary Grice, a.k.a. Jizza, grew up together in NYC listening to hip-hop and watching martial arts movies. In fact, Russell took his rapper name from a 1980 kung fu film called Old Dirty and the Bastard. Even his name is a reference to his uniqueness, as fellow Wu-Tang member Method Man puts it on their first album. All right, then we got the Old Dirty Bastard, because uh -huh. they ain't no father to his stare. That's why he the Old Dirty Bastard. With Jizza and ODB as founding members and RZA spearheading the production and five-year business plan, Wu-Tang Clan formed like Voltron, assembling an unprecedented nine MC lineup and releasing their debut album, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers on Loud Records in 1993. If you're new to this group, Old Dirty's style will stand out to you right away. He just steals the show on every track that he's on. It's almost not fair just how brightly he shines, even in the company of eight other elite-level talented rappers. And to be fair, he'd stand out in any group. First of all, his voice and delivery are just straight-up weird. It sounds like he spits when he talks, he'll add wildly inappropriate vibrato to certain lines. Niggas be coming to the hip-hop store, coming to buy grocery from me, turn out to be a hip-hop MC. He'll lapse into indecipherable screaming. Experience and for the whole experience, let it be blind, you need drop that fire. At times he'll just start doing this. My people's are you with me where you at? In the front, in the back, kill the bees on the track. My people's are you with me where you at? Smoking that, taking cats on the block with the gap. Now there are precedents for this kind of rapper. The wild card slash clownish comic relief figure was already a tradition going back to the likes of Flavor Flav, Easy E, and Biz Markie. But even among those types, ODB never sounded like anybody but himself. He lived up to his name in both fortunate and unfortunate ways. There really was no father to his style. His sheer singularity made him a no-brainer as a solo star. With an album cover that simply consists of the actual ID card that proved he was eligible for food stamps and a title that suggests it is the true follow-up to the Wu-Tang Clan's debut, Old Dirty released his first solo album, Return to the 36 Chambers, The Dirty Version, on Electro Records in 1995. In a sense, the production on the album, mostly done by RZA, but some of which he did on his own, does bring to mind a darker, grittier, and more twisted version of Enter the Wu-Tang. Bad, bad, Leroy Brown, baddest man in the whole damn town, badder than the deep blue sea, badder than you and me. Despite a number of guest spots for members of the Wu and other affiliates, the album undeniably belongs to Old Dirty. You just can't take anything away from a force of personality this defiantly unconventional. At times, the vocal parts of the album played like they just set him up one day in the studio, and pressed record, and let him just rant and free associate for as long as he wanted. Then somehow took parts of those tracks and mashed them up with beats that they had. 
but there's still a method to the madness here. Among the paranoid fantasies, rambling non sequiturs, what I can only describe as obnoxious prolonged mouth noises, and barely contained outbursts of confused rage, he does not forget to include any number of simply killer verses, some of which are so good that he eventually just ends up repeating them. Oh, chop that down, pass it all around. Lyrics get hard, quick, she back to the ground. 40 MC and any 52 states, I get psycho. Killer, Norman Bates. When I kill, battle mad, bug your flow. Not saying they saw a duck of disco. Or a disco duck, sickly hip hop. Baby, baby, I can't stop. I jump on stage, flip, rip a show. Strip a rip a hoe, hey, like Bo Jackson. While I'm still taxing, maxing, relaxing, sitting back. Like the old Dirty Bastard story starts to unravel almost right away. You take someone from a rough background with erratic behavior patterns and a support system that is just not equipped to deal with him, and then make him into a successful rapper, what do you think is going to happen? Because of the spiral of crime and drugs that he was clearly already on, his role in Wu-Tang's follow-up album Wu-Tang Forever was severely reduced. And probably, ODB ended up actually becoming one of the biggest crossover stars in mainstream rap, thanks to some of his collaborations with A-list names like Mariah Carey, Busta Rhymes, and Proz from the Fugees. Big and bold, bold, dirty bass, dirty bass, blow. In spite of the success, on a personal level, he just n could not keep his shit together. From his off-the-wall stunts, including crashing Sean Colvin's Grammy speech, to rants about Wu-Tang Forever losing to Puffy's album earlier in the night, to rolling up to the welfare office in a limousine to collect his government assistant check and inadvertently setting social services back 20 years, the actual legal troubles, including charges for assault, robbery, failure to pay child support, shoplifting, illegal drugs and weapons possession, and even wearing a bulletproof vest as a convicted felon which was a crime in the state of California at the time. Now, I'm going to try not to come down too hard on either side of the criminal career of ODB. The amount of things he was accused of was outright ridiculous, or would be for any normal person. It's not too big of a stretch to imagine him being targeted simply for being who he was a lot of the time. A lot of these charges were made little to no evidence. There are a bunch of cases dismissed and acquittals on his file. The details of his biography paint a picture, more than anything else, of an extremely unlucky man with severely poor decision-making skills. Some of it's just too weird to even make up. Like the time when he and a friend rescued a four-year-old girl from a fiery car crash, and he visited her in the hospital regularly to make sure that she was recovering. He'd been shot and shot at by cops and criminals, the guy just couldn't catch a break. By the end of the 90s, he had been involved in so many bizarre legal cases that even Chris Rock came to his defense. The ODB could not possibly committed all of those crimes. Did some of that shit. He also released his second album, with a title that I won't even pretend I can repeat, in 1999, containing one of his biggest mainstream hits, Got Your Money. Now that you heard my common voice, you couldn't get another nigga who she won't be moist. If you want to look good and not be bummy, yo, you better give me that money. The onset of the new millennium brought yet more legal and personal struggles, including, obviously, both a short-lived stint and attempted breakout from rehab. According to an article written by James Parker for Slate, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia after a three-month stay at Manhattan Psychiatric Center. Russell Jones died of a drug overdose on November 13th, 2004, after collapsing in Riz's recording studio two days before what would have been his 36th birthday. And 14 years ago this day. He had signed to Rockefeller Records after getting out of rehab and even recorded an album, which will apparently never see the light of day. Wu-Tang Clan's 2007 album, Eight Diagrams, their first release as a group since his death, closes with the song Life Changes, where each member of the clan contributes a verse commemorating the tumultuous life of their beloved friend. The most poignant one for me is the round of self-blaming that comes from Inspect the Deck. And I share the blame, cause you was calling for help, kid. Shoulda, coulda, woulda had the time, I was selfish. I carry on your struggle, he say it really hurts me. I really miss you, Russell, hope you forgive me, dirty. Old Dirty Bastard was a lost soul. A once in a generation talent, cursed with the atrocious hand that life had dealt him, who lived entirely on his own terms, probably because he had no other option. Without romanticizing the more or less near constant tragedy that was his time on this earth, I find a lot to admire about him. When he was on, he could hold his own with any MC in the world. And even when he wasn't, he was never anything less than truly compelling. I am Jacob, and this was Rad 90s Music. Rest in peace, Russell Jones.